good. All right, moving on with chapter five. I got to be honest, I'm not a big fan of this lesson. It's a little crazy. Um, and I'm going to make matters worse by showing you three different ways to solve these types of problems. Probably the first three quarters of this lesson is all pre-calc review. And it's probably pre-calc stuff that you've forgotten about. So we're gonna review that first. Then we're gonna get into some calculus. And the calculus is where things are gonna get really crazy, okay? So uh, these are inverse functions. And in particular, what we're going to be doing is taking the derivative of inverse functions. So in pre-calc, you did a bunch of work with inverse functions. You found inverse functions, you uh, talked about the domain and range of inverse functions, yada, 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 which I'll review all of that. But the new thing for today is being able to take a derivative of that. Okay. So you should be able to verify that uh, two functions are inverses of each other. This is something that comes up a lot, and I don't know how much your pre-calc teachers stress this. Every function has an inverse, but not every inverse is a function. Does that make sense? Shall I say it again? Yeah. Every function has an inverse, but not every inverse is a function. Okay? And I'll expand on that more. I'm guessing in pre-calc, your teachers probably just had you calculating inverses and the idea of functions never came up. For us, it matters. Then, like I said, we're gonna find the derivative of that inverse function, which uh, three different ways, that'll be fun. And then, of course, you should be able to eat healthier foods. Try it for a little while. Okay. Just throwing it out there. All right, so let's talk about inverse function. A little bit of review here. Two things that you need to remember, which you probably forgot. Number one, the domain of a function is the range of the inverse. The domain of the inverse is the range of the function. Okay, so I don't know about you, but if I'm given a function, I can easily find the domain. A quick review, domain possible x values. Yes, you all knew that, yeah? Yeah, because there's only two things I care about in this class. Zero denominators, negative square roots. And that's it. So that's easy to do. What I'm not so good at is ranges. Like, okay, what are my possible y values? Well, if I've got all these weird x values, how does that tell me what y values I can do? And so I don't, I don't do that. I deal with purely domains. Domains of functions, domains of inverses. And use that step one to figure out the ranges if I have to. Step two, you already knew. By, by definition, an inverse undoes a function. So if we take something very simple like x squared, the inverse of x squared would be the square root of x. The inverse of adding is subtracting. The inverse of multiplying is dividing. You get the idea. But at the bottom here is where we're going to focus a lot of our time. If they are actually inverses, if you generate a composite function between the two, you will come back to where you started. Okay, so f of f inverse of x should be x, and f inverse of f of x will also be x. Unfortunately, you need to check both. So let's do that, shall we? Here are two functions, f and g. I am thinking well, I'm being told, show that the functions are inverses. So I know this is gonna work out, especially since I wrote the problem. But let's take a look at this. So we're gonna do f of g of x. And then we're going to do g of f of x. And I'm gonna do this quickly because we have a fish to fry here. So uh, two times the cubic root of x plus one over two minus one. Uh, I forgot something, square, or cubed. There we go. Now it makes sense. I don't think I need to take you through all the steps because I think you're all bright enough to see that the cubic root cubed is gonna be itself. Multiplying by two and dividing by two is gonna cancel and one minus one is zero and sure enough, oh, we get x. Is that enough to stop? No, we need to do both. The cubic root of 2x cubed minus 1 plus 1 over 2. Okay. 
Negative one plus one, zero. Twos cancel, cubic root of x. Boink. Now we're good. They are, in fact, inverses of each other. So if we wanted to be fancy, we could say g of x is equal to f inverse of x. Does anybody remember, if I was to just give you f of x, okay, let's suppose I said to you, yo, there's f of x. How would you find the inverse? Does anybody remember? Perfect. Did y'all hear her? No. She said flip the x's and the y's, solve for y. That new equation is your inverse. 100% correct. It would be nice if every problem we had to work with with inverses was that simple. It ain't going to happen. But we will review that. Ooh, this is an important picture. And I don't know if you talked about this in pre-calculus last year, but the, the um, what color is that? The black graph is f of x. The gray graph is g of x. We know that those two functions are inverses of each other because we just did the math on the previous slide. For one of the techniques that we're going to use today, it's very important that you understand that an inverse and its function are reflections of each other over the line y equals x. Okay? An inverse and its function are reflections of each other over the line y equals x. So if I take a point over here, let's call that point AB, and I reflect that point over the line y equals x and it ends up here, what are the coordinates of that point? Hmm? BA. BA, very good which I think I have summarized here. Yes, I do. That stuff in red is also going to be important with what we do today. When you reflect over the line y equals x, the x and the y coordinates switch places, which also fits with the domain and range thing. The domain a on the function matches the range a on the inverse. The, dom the range b on the function matches the domain B on the inverse. Okay, how are we doing so far? Good? Everybody home, good to go? Everybody here, good to go? Excellent. Existence of the inverse function. Wow, that sounds impressive. So this is where we get into the realm of, yeah, sure, I found the inverse, but how do I know that inverse is a function? So let's back up. How do you know if an equation is a function? Forget about inverses for a second. How do you test for whether or not something is a function? Vertical line test. Outstanding. Who was responsible for that? Alex. Good job, Alex. Vertical line test. You all remember it, yes? If any vertical line can be drawn through a function in such that it touches more than one point, it is not a function. That would be bad. Go away. Sorry. Circles are not functions. Sideways parabolas are not functions. Good, we knew that already. If we go back to this picture, if you look at the vertical line of the y-axis, when you reflect a vertical line over the line y equals x, you get a horizontal line. So the vertical line test can then be used as the horizontal line test. Have you ever heard of the horizontal line test before? Yeah? yeah? Oh, good, 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 good. Horizontal line test tests whether or not a function's inverse is a function. Not if it has an inverse. That's different. And I think that's a common mistake that some rookie teachers like Kanopke make. You guys had Kanopke? Yeah. You know what I'm saying then, right? Well, I geometry. Did anybody have her for both geometry and pre-calc? That, would, that should be against the Geneva Convention. It's like a war crime. Okay, so horizontal line test again tests whether or not a function's inverse is also a function. Okay, this upside down parabola is a function. It passes the vertical line test. It is its inverse is not a function because it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Okay, easy peasy. 
Hakne Giri. Ooh. Story hour. A function has an inverse function if and only if it is one to one. What does one to one mean? It's only one output for every input. Outstanding. Did you guys say that? Yeah. For every output, there's one and only one input, or vice versa. So every x has only one y, every y has only one x. Beautiful. Number two, if f is strictly monotonic on its entire domain, then it is one-to-one -one and therefore has an inverse function. What does that mean? And I would have, I would not expect you to know that. That's why I included this comment. What does strictly monotonic mean? This had no application for you until this class because it involves a derivative. And we didn't do a derivative, derivative in math until calculus. But what strictly monotonic means is always increasing or always decreasing. In a non-calculus class like pre-calc, you don't have an easy way to see if a function is increasing or decreasing. For us, easy peasy lemon squeezy. If f prime of x is always positive, it's increasing. And if f prime of x is negative, it's always decreasing. Okay, so now you want to check whether or not the inverse is a function. You could apply the horizontal line test. That's great. But what if you don't have a picture? Well, if you don't have the picture, we can then use some math and this strictly monotonic phrase to determine whether the inverse is a function or not. How does that happen? Well, we take the derivative. And I just happen to have some examples. Whoosh. We're going to do this without looking at a picture because you're thinking to yourself, well, I know what a cubic looks like, but do you really? We'll see. f prime of x in part a is equal to 3x squared plus 1. What can you tell me about the function 3x squared plus 1? It is a quadratic. Is it open up or down? Up. Oh, beautiful. Anybody else? So it's going to be positive. Always positive? Why? Because it's squared. So it's two. So the x is squared. So? Um, so it's never even increasing. I don't know. That's what I'm asking you. How do I know that that's going to always be positive? Um, you got to do the number line, right? You don't even have to go that far. You're right, by the way. I just don't like your explanation. Well, like when you plug in the x, even if you plug in a negative x value, That's perfect. But what about this guy? How will that if So you're saying that this is always going to be positive, yes? Yeah. Good. So what happens when I add a positive number to a positive number? It's going to stay positive. Bingo. Oh. Okay. So this function is always greater than zero. Therefore, it's always increasing and therefore strictly monotonic and therefore its function or its inverse is a function. Questions? Okay, now of course, if there's an A and a B, you can pretty much guess what's gonna happen in part B. It's not going to work. F prime of X is equal to three X squared minus one. Staying with the same train of thought that Peter said, if you square a positive or a negative number, this puppy will always be positive, but because you're subtracting from it, it does not guarantee that that thing is always positive or always negative. Therefore, not strictly monotonic. Its inverse is not a function. Dead in the water, move on, have a nice day. Questions? We're doing okay so far? Okay, other than the phrase strictly monotonic, this should all pretty much be review a little bit, hopefully. Don't you love when teachers say that? You should know this. Just to verify what we just did with the graph, here's a graph of the first one. Oh, look, it's always increasing. Yeehaw. Here's a graph of the second one. Not always increasing. We got some maxes and some mins in there. 
therefore not strictly monotonic, therefore it has no, well, my phrasing is wrong, I'm sorry. That it should not say it has no inverse. It has an inverse, but the inverse is not a function. I should fix that. I have failed you, I'm sorry. Okay, this we did already. Thank you, Hannah. If you actually want to find the inverse function, switch the x and the y, solve for y, what you get is the inverse. Oh, it's snowing out. Here comes the apocalypse. Okay. Okay, so here we go. We're going to start with something easy peasy. Y is equal to the square root of 2x minus 3. Please calculate what the inverse of f of x is. I will wait. Take a drink. Oh, that's good. Hey Lee, help me out. What do you got? I haven't finished it yet. Okay. Now you got it? No, honestly, I don't know how to do it. Sam? Sam, I don't know how to do it either. Um, Roman? I'm just going to go right up that column. Uh, this might be a guess, but is it half 2x minus 3 to negative 1 half multiplied by 2? No. Gavin? Hold on. Gavin? Um, Campbell? I don't think I have all that. Like, I'm pretty sure the first half would be just x minus root 3. It's just like, I'm not sure what to do with the root 2. Get that out of the problem. Angelina? <laughs> um, is it x squared plus 3 over 2? I know you can't hear it, but in the classroom they all just went, yay! But it was kind of subdued. They didn't want to get crazy. But yes, that is correct. Yes, that is correct? Yeah. Good x equals the square root of 2y minus 3. Switch the x's and the y's solve. How do you undo square root? You square. Add 3 to both sides. Divide by 2. This is the inverse, which goes there. Well done. So we don't want to check to confirm that. I'm not going to put that into the other one and do that whole X thing because it's like beating a dead horse. We don't need to do that because we're trusting our mathematical skills and we're trusting Angelina that she did it correctly. Okay. There's that picture again. Love it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, ho, ho. okay. This is going to get ugly. So let me talk about method number one first. Then we'll take a couple minute break. Then I will scramble your noodle with the other two methods, okay? So if I want a derivative of an inverse function, the one way you could do it would be to figure out what the inverse function is and then take the derivative. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, so if I go back to this puppy, whoops. If I go back to this puppy, 
this mess. There. If I wanted to know what is f inverse of x prime, I could calculate the inverse function and then take the derivative of it. It would be nice if all problems left you that luxury of doing that method. That ain't going to happen. Okay, but it is the first possibility. Calculate the inverse, take the derivative. Methods two and three in four minutes. Have a nice break. I'm not even going to pause it. No swearing, I'm still recording. Carol. So option one is just take the inverse and then take the derivative? Okay. You, you got it. Yep. But you can imagine if the fun well, we'll talk about this, but if the function is nasty, yeah. which, oh, I don't know, maybe I have an example of that. Taking the inverse is not a, a pleasant experience. Cancel school now. This is unsafe. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Young drivers in snow are not two things that go well together. <laughs> Can you spell ditch? <laughs> you should just rush to your car and drive out of the parking lot quickly. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Drive like a madman. I tried doing that. Uh -huh. It's the end of the world. Been in a bus when it fishtails? Fishtails when the, you know when you like when you go around turning it like drifts. Oh, it's scary as hell. <laughs> I remember that. If I remember correctly, I was like supreme jag because you came into class late and then you're like, I was in a bus accident. Like, All right, fine. If that's the excuse you're going with. Like you wanted sympathy and everything. Like, oh, I was in a bus crash. Oh, I'm sore. What's that? Put it on the party video. But I'm gonna put it in quotes. What? So, gee, what happens to be the common factor there? My bus driver. Oh, you think that's what it was? It had nothing to do with you, right? Okay. The day you were late, though, is, if I remember, it was a pretty serious accident, wasn't it? Didn't you get T-boned or something? <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, no. you, you, you no. forgot. I mean, you blanked it out. No. Right? It's just, you, you remember getting up in the morning and doing your hair, and then you remember coming into my class. No, and you, yeah. no I ran to the bus that day because that's really late. I, I was on the phone. I had a girl one time come into class. She, was, uh, she missed a, a day of school. And then she came in the next day, and I said, hey, what's going on? Where were you? And I noticed she had two black eyes, and her nose was all swollen. <laughs> she went home at lunch, and while she was driving home, she had a sneezing fit and plowed into a tree. Head first into a tree in her car. 
Broke her nose on the steering wheel, two black eyes, the whole bit. It's totaled the car. Yeah, it is horrible. I just felt bad. Still pretty funny, though. All right, let's do this. All right, we're back. Let's go. Here we go. All right. Um, so, our other two methods. The first one is a formula. And uh, you know me well enough to know by now I'm not a huge fan of formulas, but here it is. I would use the bottom one if you're going to use the formula. The problem for me in that formula is a lot of that is a little incomprehensible. Like, where am I going to get f inverse of x? Then where's the derivative come from and what am I plugging into this? But when I'm done with everything, if this formula makes sense to you, then by all means, use it. I'm not telling you it's not a good thing to do. I just have a different approach that makes more sense to me and maybe it's because I teach geometry or I'm a visual learner, or I'm just weird. But when I show you that third technique, you may find it more appealing. Okay? Questions? All right. Let's do version number three. To get version number three, I'm going to go back a little bit because I need a picture. We'll use this picture. Nope, oh, bring that picture back. You will go away now. Erasing, 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 erasing. Okay, so we're going to use this picture as an example. And the example says this. There's a lot of things here that we already talked about, and that is an inverse is the reflection of the function over the line y equals x. So we got the black and the gray. They are inverses of each other. The other thing to notice is that the point 2, 1 becomes the point 1, 2 on the graph. Okay. So if the problem says to you, what is the derivative of the inverse of this function, it's asking you for the slope of the tangent line at some point. Are we good with that? In other words, I'm asking you to find the slope of that line. And if you plug and chug into the formula, you can find that directly. I take a different approach. And my, my approach doesn't use the inverse. It uses the original function. And so what I do in simplistic terms, and I'll show you what this looks like in an example, I find the slope of the blue line, but I also know the relationship between the slope of the blue line and the slope of the red line, and here's the key. The relationship is, let's call this m1 and we'll call this m2, m1 is equal to 1 over m2. They are reciprocals of each other, not opposite reciprocals, not floppicits. You've had that burned into your brain since third grade or whenever you do algebra. It's not opposite reciprocals, it's just the reciprocal. So I go and find the blue line slope, take my answer, flip it over, and pfft, I'm done. And you'll see, after I work through the example that I have for you, how the formula does make sense because the components that I use to do it my way are wrapped up into that formula. Okay, questions before I leave the picture? We good to go? Right. So the top slope is the one that's equal to the one over? Either one, they're reciprocals of each other. Okay. So if I, if I knew the red one, I could flip it over to find the blue. If I knew the blue, you could flip okay. it over to the okay. red. Okay. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Okay, so what does that look like? Let's get up to my example here. There's a function. Okay, so here we go. Now, in order to streamline things, I did cheat a little bit, and I'll explain this. Okay, so I want to know what is f inverse of 3, what is the derivative of f inverse at 3? That's what I'm solving for. Now, what does that mean? That means the point 3 comma something is on the inverse. Okay? Here's the key. If 3 comma something is on the inverse, then something comma 3 is on the function. And let me stop for a second to do a checking, uh, an understanding check. 
Does, is everybody with me? Does that make sense? Okay, a lot of head shot, head shotting, shot not a hitting head of Padushina. I just lost the capability of speech. Well, instead of looking for this, I'm going to look for this. How do I find that? I go back to the original function. If I know what the y value is, I can find the x value, right? I would take one fourth x cubed plus x minus one and set it equal to three. For this particular problem, I cheated. And how did I cheat? I'm just going to tell you that x equals two. You're going to have to trust me on this one. Because I don't want to deal with how to find x in that case because it's a cubic and all this other stuff. So you just have to trust me. So what do we know? We know that x is two here, which makes y two there. Now I'm done with the inverse. Because now this tells me what I need to find is f prime of two, whoops, f prime of two. And then, last step, flip the answer over. Okay. Well, that's easy. Should be easy. f prime of x is equal to tree force x squared plus one. So f prime of two, whoops, of two is uh, four, three, three, so is four. Two squared is four times three fourths is three plus one is four. Which means that f inverse of three, the derivative is going to be one over four because it's the reciprocal of the answer I get based on the original function. With my method, the thing that I find tricky is working this business out. But notice the relationship between the x's and y's of each of those functions. That's why early on I stress the idea that domain and ranges flip. The x of the inverse is the y of the function. The y of the function is the, no, I said that wrong. The x of the function is, yeah, whatever, you know, blues and reds, okay? Questions? All right. Now, if you want to use the formula, I have that in here somewhere. That's what we already did with that. Okay, here it is. This is what we, all right, we would get that. This business here is what we did already to find the point that we need on the inverse function. This we calculated. f prime of 2 was 4, therefore our final answer is 1 fourth. Same, same. Now you may be looking at this equation and saying, I, I like the formula. It seems pretty straightforward. I'm going to go with that. And that's cool. I don't care. As long as you can get to this 1 fourth and show your work, whichever of the three methods works is okay. You'll also notice that I glanced over the first method on this particular problem. And why did I do that? Because if you look at this function, I don't know about you, but if I turn those into y's, I don't know how to solve that. I can't do it. Maybe you can, and if you can, good job. I don't know how to, so you have to use one of the other two methods. If it's a nice, easy function, then by all means, find the inverse, take the derivative, plug and chug, you're good to go. But you can probably count on that not happening very often. I know your brain's about to melt. I also see some heads uh, nodding and saying, yes, that is the case. That's why we're going to stop here. Okay? So let's talk about uh, a couple things. You'll recall what I talked about the other day and that your homework tonight has a, uh, an element left over from the last section. Okay. This is 5-3. Yes? The first part of the homework tonight is from 5-2 to finish that up, and then the rest will be this. Next time I see you, which is today's third Monday, we'll move on to the next section. Or no, actually we won't. You'll have 5-3 stuff. Everything is laid out on the calendar. We also have the calendar fixed up to take into account the four-day weekend and the three-day weekend, so you can see when tests and quizzes will be on the calendar and plan accordingly. 
Obviously, we're going to honor the um, four-day weekend, and so you will have nothing to do over the weekend. You'll have plenty of time ahead of time to get it done, put it away, and enjoy your four days. When is that? Next week. Is it next week? It starts Friday, Friday, and then Monday. Of next week. So today's the fourth, fifth, seventh. Yes, correct. So we have uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday off. And I will see you guys on Thursday, no, on Wednesday, I think. I think A day is the last day. Yeah. And then, so I, I'll see you on Wednesday, but then I, I'll see you on Tuesday then. So you'll be on the front end oh, of, oh, up after the four-day weekend. Okay. It splits the two days. Is it a normal weekend? The four-day is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The three-day is not. You'll get homework then.